Okay, everybody, hope you enjoyed your lunch. Now we're getting back into it. We've got Daniel Axton's here, who's come all the way from Canberra with his cheerleading squad over there. <laughs> and hecklers. And he's going to spend the next 45 minutes talking to us about ecosystems of Docker. Thank you. So, let me tell you a story. I was working on a project in Ruby, and because I work for IBM on power systems, I was running this on a 64-bit little Indian power PC chip. And someone, I think it was a colleague of mine, tried to install the Ruby foreign function interface gem, and it didn't install out of the box. Now, this was actually really easy to rectify. It bundled an old version of a library, but it would happily pick up the system library if it was there. But it got me thinking, how many other gems are going to be broken without my knowledge? People obviously don't tend to write their gems for power. They write them for x86 and maybe test them on ARM. Uh, so the author probably won't pick it up if it's broken. So how would we know? And how would we know unless we tested all of them? I mean, we could wait for customers to complain, but let's try and be you know, good corporate people and be proactive. So let's see if we could test all the packages. So how big a... Uh, undertaking is this? Well, large. Uh, there are about 125,000 Ruby packages, over 350,000 NPM packages, almost 100,000 PyPy packages, and other languages trail off from there. Uh, when I submitted the abstract, if you summed Ruby, NPM, and PyPy, you got to about 400,000. Now, if you sum Ruby, NPM, and PyPy, you get to probably over 500,000. So this is a big problem and getting bigger. So I didn't even know if this was particularly feasible. Uh, so I wanted to you know, throw something together and get a, sort of a first pass. So I wanted something that was simple. And I wanted something that was fast. So I'm willing to wait you know, overnight, maybe over a weekend for some results. But I'm not willing to wait a month to find out this data. And as a result, I'm willing to make some trade-offs for accuracy. So I can accept a small number of false negatives, so things that are reported as being broken but which aren't and a small number, preferably a much smaller number, of false positives, so things that are reported as working but are actually not working. And because, having worked on PowerPC for a couple of years now, I have some idea of the sorts of problems that I'm expecting to find, so the test that I chose to do on each of these packages is just to see, does it install? Because I know that if it installs, if the code builds and the code installs, it's probably going to work. And that's good enough for what I set out to do. Um, so that's what I did. Um, let's do a live demo. Live demos are cool. Um, normally, what I'd want to do is tell you all about how I had got there and the steps and the methodology, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a reasonably long process because we're building lots of things. So let's get this kicked off, and then we'll talk through how it all fits together once we're um, ready to go. Now, this is my VM. Can, is that big enough for everyone to see? Good? OK. So this is a Linux PowerPC VM, so PPC64 LE. Um, it's reasonably large. LS CPU reports 80 CPUs, uh, which is quite nice. And it also has a beautifully large amount of memory. Uh, it has 128 gigs of memory. So this is a pretty large machine. You should buy power. They've got brilliant large machines. Um, that is the end of plugging. <laughs> um, so to show you I have nothing up my sleeve, I'm going to flush the database where I store my results, which will at some point show up. There we go. OK. Python manage py flush. And yes, I know this is going to destroy all my data. Yes, yes, yes. And then I'm going to start the web server. And now, instead of a bad gateway, I should be told that my database has zero packages in it. So we have a blank slate. There is nothing up my sleeve. Let's start some tests. And we get a lovely warning encouraging me to be a good citizen. And then stuff is happening. Oh, sorry. 
let me reset the state again. And okay. So things are happening. While this is happening, we'll come back and look at the results. Um, let's talk about what we're doing and where we're going, and we'll check in on that later. So we've looked at what we're trying to do. We're trying to test an entire ecosystem, why we might want to do that to see if it all works on a different platform. Uh, we're going to look at how that works. So we've started it running what's under the hood. So we're going to look at how we test a single package, how we test all the packages, how we do that quickly, and how to process the results. We then going to look at the results and some of the more amusing bugs, and see other things that we could do with this sort of technology, and wrap up. So at the core of what I'm doing, I need to be able to test a package. And I need some sort of test system to do that. And my test system needs to ensure a couple of things. Tests shouldn't influence each other. So if I'm testing package A and I'm testing package B and they're incompatible, we shouldn't notice that. They should both be tested. And tests shouldn't permanently affect the host on which they're running. So they should be ephemeral. And to do that, we need, well, I mean, I could try and manually unpick all the files that each install does and manually undo all of the changes, but I don't trust myself to do that. So I want some sort of isolation technology. I want something in which to build my test system. And I want three things from it. I want it to give me good isolation, both because I want my tests to be isolated and ephemeral, but also because I'm basically running untrusted code from the internet. So I would like something to protect my machine from that code. I'd like it to be low overhead. So as we saw, Ruby has over 125,000 packages. If it takes half a minute of CPU time to bring up this isolated environment, that's 43 days of CPU time, and that is too much CPU time. Even if we spread it across lots, even if across 80 cores, it's still too much. And lastly, I want it to be easy to script. And I there are two things sort of under that umbrella. I need to be able to bring up and tear down these isolated environments in a scripted way. And I also need to be able to get information in and get information out in a scripted way. So I need to be able to get in the package I want to test, get out, success, failure, log file. So those are my criteria. There were three things that came to mind. Uh, virtual machines, chroots, and containers. Virtual machines give us great isolation, terrible overhead, and they're not amazing to interact with scriptedly. Like, you can do it, but it's not super fun. Um, Chroots are sort of the opposite extreme. They offer pretty terrible isolation in that they just isolate the file system. Uh, they are, on the other hand, incredibly low overhead. And interacting with them, it's easy to get information in and out of them because they're just processes. But dealing with spinning up an isolated environment and tearing it down again is a little bit more complicated, and the tooling is not so great. Containers are sort of a a midpoint in that they offer decent isolation, they offer reasonably good overhead, and they give you some trade-offs in this area as well. And what I think is really the winning thing for containers is that if you've got an abstraction like Docker sitting on top of your containers, it's really easy to interact with them. And this is both in terms of spinning them up and spinning them down and getting information in and out. So you know, density aside, I think Docker's scriptability was the thing that made it a big win. So let me show you what I mean by that. So this is on my laptop, so it should run a bit faster. Um, let's run a Docker container. So let's run interactively and with an attached terminal, cleaning up after ourselves and passing in an environment variable foo, the value, value bar. Let me make that a bit bigger. Uh, a container called Ubuntu. And so Docker behind the scenes will find me the container image named Ubuntu, and it has now, I'm now sitting inside this container. So I'm in a completely isolated file system. I can do whatever, and it shouldn't affect the host. I can very helpfully get um, the contents of the variable from outside. And if I exit with some meaningful exit status, and I'm running fish shell, so instead of $0, it's dollar status. That exit status is preserved outside the container. So my hope is that it makes it pretty 
that it's pretty easy to imagine how you would go from that ability to bring up a container, have it automatically cleaned up when you're done, get information in, get information out into a test system. Uh, and so that's what I did. <laughs> so let's build a container to test Ruby rather than a generic container. Um, I'm, I'm trying not to assume any background in Docker here, so I'm going to talk you through the process. And I'm also going to highlight that it is really simple. Uh, it is so simple, in fact, to build this test system that I'm going to put all the code on the screen, uh, and it will take all of five slides. Uh, this is the Docker file. So this is, in, in Docker parlance, you take a Docker file and you build an image. And then that image is what's used to run containers. And those containers are isolated. They can't see each other. The changes that you make to a container file system don't affect the underlying image. So this is analogous to VM snapshots or copy on write, those sorts of things. So here is the Docker file that, that I am running, minus two lines of site-specific proxies. Uh, let's go. So the first thing we do is, so Docker files are written in their own little language. It's reasonably straightforward, and I'm going to talk you through it. So from PPC 64 little endian Ubuntu, this says, based on this pre-existing container, which someone at IBM has helpfully made available on the internet, take the Ubuntu little endian PPC container version 16.04 and build on top of that. Then I install a bunch of packages. So these are helpful because a bunch of Ruby gems try and interact with C libraries, and these are some of the more popular C libraries that people interact with, so I've installed all their development files. Next thing I do is commit the terrible sin of piping shell scripts to bash. Uh, this is installing RVM. So RVM is a technology for isolating different Ruby versions and allowing people to install Ruby packages without necessarily being a sysadmin um, or without going through the distribution packages. So here I am installing, uh, I'm getting the key, I'm installing RVM and Ruby 2.2.6 because it's a sort of mid-range stable version, cleaning up a little bit, and then I'm creating an unprivileged user called tester, and I'm giving that user the ability to administer Ruby packages by adding them to the group RVM. So we don't strictly need RVM, but it allows us to manage packages without being root and without messing around with paths and stuff. Um, so then we run user tester. So we're now dropping privileges in our Docker container to tester. So everything before this has run as root inside the container, and everything after this is running as this unprivileged user inside the container. And that hopefully reduced the reduces the attack surface for malicious gems, which is good. Um, this installs the Nokogiri gem, which is just slow to install, so, and like a billion things depend on it, so we get that out of the way early. These two lines, uh, three lines, push everything through a local HTTP proxy. I'll explain, like, why would you go through HTTP? Isn't that insecure? I will explain why this is a good idea later. Um, trust me on it for now. And this is the final part of the Docker file. And this says, when we run a container based on this image that we're building, the command that I want you to run in the container is bash with loading our VM and installing the gem given by the environment variable gem. So that's, and I'll sort of let you stare at that in wonderment for a second. Uh, that is all you need to test a gem. And so, let's do that. Of course, we will wait again for our network to catch up. Hmm. OK, while we're waiting for that, I will talk about what we're about to do next, and hopefully the network will catch up at some point. This allows us to test a gem. And this will give us a success, a failure, a log file. What this doesn't do for us, which is kind of important, is give us any ability to enforce a timeout. And this is a bit unfortunate because we would quite like timeouts. 
for a number of reasons. One is mostly because we don't want this to take forever. We'd quite like this to run quickly and let us do other things with our lives. And because it's a first pass, if, so, if lots of things are timing out, we can go back and check them individually later or in some sort of scripted way. So, let So, let's build, Docker has 1K. So, this says build with the Docker file and information in the local directory, a Docker container called Ruby test. Um, this is all cached by Docker internally, so it was very fast, which was nice. And now let's run that container with Docker run. And this is running it. Dash IT says interactively RM clean up afterwards. Don't worry too much about those other lines. And we're passing in the Rails gem as the gem we want to test. And if we do that, it will ponder for a second. And it is downloading all of the things and fetching them. And we'll start compiling them shortly. And there we go, it has succeeded, apparently. And if we echo dollars status, ATUS, it should tell us zero, which is success. There we go, hooray. So we said, so we can now test a package. We can test any package, we just change the thing that we pass in in the environment option. As I was saying, the one thing we're missing is a timeout. And so we want to be able to do a sort of timeout. This is another two slides, which is a script that does that. And it also collects our results and sends them <laughs> off somewhere. So we set it, we load a timeout, we load the gem that we want to run, we load a timeout, and we do Docker run. Uh, this time, instead of running it interactively, we're running it detached, um, which is dash D. And then we're running a bunch of things in tempfs, which is a speed up, which I'll get to later. So docker run with the environment variable that we were given. And we're running the Ruby test docker image that we built. And then we're waiting for it to finish with docker wait. And we're imposing a timeout on that with timeout. So this says run wait for that container to finish, and if it doesn't finish in 240 seconds, give up. And then it captures the result of that and sticks it in a shell variable. This is a very messy way of dealing with that. <laughs> if docker wait succeeds, it will print the exit status of the container. If the timeout kicks in, we will instead get nothing. So we first check if there's nothing. If there's nothing, we clean up the container and say there was a timeout. If we've got the code not equal to zero, then we have a failure. If we have a code that is equal to zero, we have a success. Uh, this is made a little bit more complicated because I throw all the results in a Postgres database. Uh, but you can very much start with flat files, and I've done that before. Um, and I still do that with R. So this is a bit messy and a bit more complex than you need to start with. But this is the entire script, again, in two slides. And this should allow us now to run a complete test and see the results printed. So let's test Rails again. So firstly, again, to show you I have nothing up my sleeve, is there anything in the database for Rails? No, there is not. There's just lots of things that contain Rails in the name. This script that I just showed you, I've called test it, which is a sort of very you know, meaningful name. And I'm going to test it on Rails. And it will say testing Rails. All of the Docker stuff will now happen in the background rather than interactively. And in a moment, it will pop out success, hopefully. And then we can see, hooray. And then we can see the log file. If we repeat this search, we should now have, hey, the database contains the result for Rails. The build succeeded, hooray. And it contains all of the output that scrolled past us on the terminal last time in our web database. And so now, with two slides of Docker files and two slides of shell scripts, we can test any arbitrary Ruby package 
we can test it with a timeout of our choosing and we have a nice ephemeral test system. Oh, we can clean up afterwards. And I've just done that. So, now we want to test everything rather than one thing. So previously, we've built a test system for one thing. We've built it with a timeout. We want to test everything. This is my favorite part. Um, this is the entire contents of test.sh. It has two lines. One of them does stuff. So test.sh invokes GNU Parallel, which is a wonderful tool uh, to run things in parallel. Specifically, we're running dot slash test at dot sh, which is the script that we just saw testing Rails. It is pulling every line out of the file gems and one by one substituting it in where that pair of curly brackets is. It's doing it with a parallelism of 30, and dash j will be familiar if you've ever used make. And job log and resume allow us to actually ab abort and resume this process, which is really helpful. Um, and that's how you do it. There is one extra trick. How do we get the contents of gems? We just very nicely ask the gem command for a list of all of the gems on the global gem repository. And then we use awk to just print the name rather than the name and the version. Um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that is the five slides of all the code that you need to do this. There are a couple of other bonus extras that we'd like to do. Uh, we'd like to do this quickly, uh, and we'd like to display the results meaningfully and post-process them in some sensible way. The first thing I want to talk about in terms of going fast is caching. Specifically, how you avoid the situation of your sysadmin coming up to your desk and asking you why you're using 40 megabits of the office's 50 megabit pipe. What we're doing is really quite dumb. In particular, it's dumb because it ignores the dependency graph. So if Rails depends on all of those things, when I so active support something, when I go and run through my list of gems that I'm installing, I'm going to run a container that installs active support and it's going to go to the network and download active support. And then later on in the process, I'm going to go and download Rails. And it's going to hit the network both for the Rails gem and for all of its dependencies. So it's going to go again and grab active support. And if you've got a popular gem, like any of the things that Rails depends on, you're going to go to the network a lot for those things. And so what we can do is interpose a cache. Uh, Squid is a popular caching system. Those lines that pushed everything through a weird local proxy, push everything through Squid, and it saves you about, well, two-thirds of your requests and two-thirds of traffic by byte. So you get a very, very large win uh, by interposing a proxy. Uh, this is one of those things that used to be, back in the day, sysadmins realized that they could save a lot of traffic and make everyone's user experience better by doing this for web traffic generally. It turns out, these days, that's not so helpful because HTTPS is everywhere. So, but it, you can still use it for this, and there's still lots of wins for that. Uh, other limiting factors are disk I.O. So I talked about uh, those random tempfs lines. So all of these containers, we just want to throw them away afterwards. So ideally, we don't want them to hit the disk at all. This is quite tricky in Docker for various intricate reasons that I don't propose to go into. But what we can do is put some of the more heavily trafficked things onto RAM disks explicitly, and that's what those four lines do. For Node.js and NPM, interestingly, the uh, disk is not the bottleneck. It's either network bandwidth or just CPU bandwidth and the time it takes to spin up a Docker container, because Docker has lots of locking internally. The thing is, you can sort of analyze these for a long time, but you end up with diminishing returns pretty quickly. Once you've hit the big ones, so disk or network, and once you've tuned your concurrency, your dash J number, like it takes about eight hours to do all of Ruby, and nine hours, it takes a couple of days to do Node.js, it's a few hours to do R. Knocking 10% off that, you're still going to need to leave it overnight or over a weekend, depending on what you're doing. So I haven't sort of optimized this to the nth degree for that reason. The next thing I want to talk about is how we actually use this data. So 
as I mentioned, I used flat files originally, and that worked really well up until the point where you've got about you know, 100,000 of these, and then you want some better way to look at them. So at the moment, they're being displayed, as you probably figured, in a uh, Django, Python, Postgres thing. I'm working on getting that or something like it out the door as open source, but you really don't need that in order to get started. Flat files work really, really well, and grep. The one thing I do want to talk about is post-processing the data, because it turns out package repositories are a low-quality data source. Uh, they have a lot of broken things in them. So they have packages with broken dependencies. So this one's trying to get both version 3 and version 4.2 of active support at the same time. Uh, you get things that use the C API for whatever language that you're building in the wrong way, um, because they're super out of date. And you get other dumb errors, like people just not packaging the main file in their alleged package. Um, we want to filter these out somehow, because for my use case, which is figuring out whether things work on power, if these packages are broken everywhere, they're not just broken on power, so I don't want to consider them. And I, at the moment, just use blind string matching on the logs to figure this out, and that's worked really well. So let's see how the process is going. So we've looked at what we can build. We've looked at how it fits together. We've seen that you can do it in five slides. How is it actually going? So in the time that we have been talking, we have tested over 5,000 packages, and 97.73% of them are going, uh, are succeeding, once we take out things that are broken for reasons that aren't power specific. And not very many of them are timing out. So we could probably even have made that timeout more aggressive and got through slightly more. So that's quite exciting. Uh, I have actually run this over a slightly longer time period. And it turns out that that number stays pretty much the same. So for Ruby on PowerPC, you've got at least 96% of your non-broken packages installed quite happily. Node.js, it's 97. And R, it's even better still. So you know, by power, your stuff will already work. Uh, the things that are broken are very much long tails, so they're things that someone's uploaded a package once that is my name dash some other package where they've played with it and haven't kept it up to date. The, all of the package repositories are basically append only, so there's no real way to curate them and clean out stuff. So that's the sort of thing that's happening. The sort of bugs that we are seeing are quite boring. Um, so as I was saying, most of them are broken slash obsolete packages in your repository. Um, then you've got things like a lot of these are wrapping libraries. If you're trying to wrap some Oracle Java database or some IBM database, I haven't installed the dependencies in the container that you need, so you're going to fail. Uh, config.sub and config.guess, so PowerPC64 Little Endian is a reasonably new platform, not super new, but new enough that a bunch of those files don't know what they are, and so that sometimes needs to be fixed. Tailing off, we've got a few packages that make x86-specific assumptions. So hash functions seem to be really bad at just assuming that they can compile their SSE Intel intrinsic code everywhere without checking, uh, and that obviously breaks if you're not on an Intel chip with SSE. And then once you've got rid of all of those, you end up with the actual real problems, of which there are very few. This does get a bit harder on your infrastructure. Uh, so Docker, we've talked about how Docker works. It needs to store its stuff somewhere. The default Docker storage driver is AUFS on Ubuntu. It's a bit different on Fedora, but on Ubuntu, it's AUFS, and you should not use that. Uh, there are a few reasons you should not use that. This number here, you probably can't read. It's spending 80% of its time in a spin lock. Uh, this was when I was compiling PHP in an AUFS container. Uh, it is very inefficient on parallel systems. It also hangs randomly from time to time, and it's an out-of-tree kernel module. So don't use it, use overlay. Um, also, I found my kernel was hanging occasionally, and so I went, oh, I'll upgrade to the latest. Um, so my background is in kernel development. Let's upgrade to the latest thing. Um, this sometimes leads to exciting errors. Uh, so just this one, <laughs> I tried to install it, and everything broke in new and exciting ways. And it turned out that there were changes in both uh, ext4 and overlay that didn't sit well together. So 
we are sitting on the bleeding edge, or at least we were. Um, this, when I first started this, it was about a year ago. So this I reported in March. A lot of things have got better since then. So when I started, the latest and greatest was Ubuntu 15.04. We're now getting worryingly close to 17.04. Uh, and in the intervening time, lots of bugs have been shaken out, and everything's a lot better. So we've seen how we do it. We've seen what happens. I want to talk about a couple of other thing, ways you can take this and the interesting things you can do with it. Uh, I was going to talk about CI, uh, but I didn't make as much progress on that as I was hoping. So if that interests you, ask me about it later. What I would like to talk about is just other things you can do with a toolkit that tests an entire ecosystem. So currently, we're taking an ecosystem, so Ruby, Node.js, uh, and we're testing an install process on all of them, and we're seeing what the result is. You can actually be more generic, and you can take any ecosystem, and you can run any process on it, and you can get results out of that process. Something that I thought would be interesting to try is running static analysis over a Ruby ecosystem. So CPP check is an open source static analysis tool. Static analysis, lots of people have been talking about it at LCA, technique for doing, detecting bugs in code without running it, basically. So here's a, an example. Uh, this is a completely arbitrary C function that takes an integer input, and if the integer input is less than zero, it complains that it can't operate on negative values. But what it's done is before it returns, it's allocated some memory. And it only actually frees the memory if you, have, if you don't pass in an invalid value. So there's a potential here for a memory leak. If you compile this with GCC, even with all the warnings on, it won't complain. But if you run CPP check over it, it will quite happily warn you that you have a memory leak. So that's quite good. And it, hopefully, it even points out the warning on that line there, which gives you a good idea of how to find the, um, where the error actually came from. So what I decided to do was run CPP check over the Ruby gem ecosystem. Um, this is the script. I hacked up my script in my Docker file to run CPP check, and I dumped the results to flat files. Um, here's what I found. Let's kill that so that we have a chance of finishing in a reasonable time. So let's do, so this time we're running Docker, we're running Ruby test, and we're overriding the command to just run bash. Let's load the RVM script. And let's install. GSL. GSL is bindings for the GNU Scientific Library. I have no idea what it does. So while this is compiling, this you must remember or nothing that follows will seem exciting. You shouldn't be able to get the Ruby interpreter to crash. You should be able to run any command you like. You should be able to get Ruby internal errors. So it should tell you you're doing something invalid. But under no circumstances should the interpreter itself crash. Bear this in mind while this compiles. So this I found while I ran CPP check over everything. I grabbed through the results for interesting things that I thought would make for good demos. Uh, and I then searched through the results of that to make sure that I was picking on a package that actually had been developed in the last you know, three years and had more than like 100,000 downloads. So there's, because as I said, everything is quite old, there are lots of things that you could pick on, but no one really uses, so it's sort of pointless. This, on the other hand, I feel a bit more justified in looking at. Let's load the gem. And now, let's run This method. I don't know what this is supposed to do. What it does do is crash rather amazingly. And eventually, this will finish scrolling through. Ruby is very, very verbose in its crash dumps. And eventually, it will finish, and I will scroll up and show you. 
I probably won't because the network's jammed. Um, what happens is it's trying to dereference a null pointer. And if you read through the CPP check output, um, it points you to this. And this code uh, assigns the pointer PA to null and then two lines later tries to dereference it and write to a member. Um, this does not work. <laughs> OK, here we go. We're, we're starting to see. Ruby is quite chatty when it crashes. Here we go. OK. Um, bug segmentation fault. Oh, you can't see that. Bug segmentation fault at um, zero. So it's trying to dereference a null pointer. Don't do that. Um, let's report that. Here's a bug report I prepared earlier. <laughs> and there we go. So to recap very quickly, there are lots of cases where you might want to test an entire ecosystem. In my case, I wanted to see if things ran on power. We can do this with Docker and some shell scripts. It's quite simple. It's good fun. Uh, it all fits on five slides because we optimized for simplicity. And with GNU Parallel, we can make it all run in parallel very nicely. Most things work, which is really exciting. Most things work across lots of ecosystems, and all of the things that you actually want to run work. The things that don't work are usually packages that no one really cares about. Not only can we test packages with this, we can actually apply this to an arbitrary test you want to run over packages, and with CPP check, we can find some interesting results pretty quickly. I want to wrap up with some final thoughts. Uh, the first is don't do it yourself. Uh, there are an astonishing variety of existing tools to do cool stuff. Um, GNU Parallel, Timeout, Squid, Docker. If I had to write this stuff from scratch, this would never have happened because I can justify spending a little bit of time chasing interesting ideas at work, but I cannot rewrite Docker. Um, and lastly, the theme of this, I just want to tie into the theme of the conference. The theme is the future of open source. And it's really easy to come along and say, oh, the future of open source is cool new stuff. Uh, I want to argue that the future of open source is not cool new stuff. I want to suggest to you that the future of open source is actually boring stuff at scale. Things like curating our ecosystems and actually dropping packages that are old and broken and unmaintained and just don't work. Things like fixing cross-platform issue, uh, cross issues and keeping them fixed. Things like fixing static analysis warnings and keeping them fixed. These sorts of things are admittedly boring, but they are also essential, and they're essential to doing things well rather than in some sort of slapdash way and hoping for the best. The future of open source, boring stuff at scale, and this is a tool that helps you do that. Thank you. Uh, first of all, nice scale. Uh, you mentioned in the middle that you don't do any dependency graph work. Have you thought about adding that, particularly for things like NPM and, and Ruby, where you, know, you look at installing Rails and you installed, I don't know, 30 packages that had to succeed to get Rails yep. there that you could just cross off the list? It's funny you should ask. Um, yes. Uh, specifically for CI, like the big problem in the next step for this is in CI is running this all the time, but it takes two days to run it um, for Node.js, and that's too long. So as you've mentioned, there is a dependency graph. Here is a sample dependency graph. Um, you've got packages that depend on a bunch of things. What I propose to do, but have yet to actually make time to do, is basically reverse that dependency graph. So the arrows aren't really big enough. Crack depends on pop version 1 or further. Snap depends on pop version 0 0.1 to 0 0.5. I'm throwing away the version information, reversing those arrows, and then flattening that into, so that's a tree structure. Let's flatten that into lists. So this saying, a change to buzz, you can't see where I'm pointing, 
Uh, a change to buzz affects fizz, affects snap. We can say then, if we change buzz, it affects fizz and snap. And then we can look through, at least this is possible with NPM, I haven't tried it with Ruby. It's possible to query the Cassandra database that backs NPM just for changes and then apply this list to them and just check the things that, have changed, that are affected by that change. Um, you could also then go and say, if we've successfully tested, say, Ruby, we can mark all those other packages off as successful as well. But the complexity to do that wasn't worth it, uh, especially at this, like, is this even possible stage? Yeah. Right, well, thanks to Avi. You've actually kind of just answered one of my questions. It was, are you obsessed with the number 42, or are you just trying to hide some slides? <laughs> I was just trying to hide some slides. Because uh, you keep using 42 as the answer. Yes. It's a good answer. More questions? Oh. And can you stand up when you ask your question, please, so the speaker can see you? <laughs> please. Uh, yeah, so um, since you're running a lot of containers on one machine, from my understanding, um, have you run into issues with Docker crashing once you get past like a thousand uh, containers? Because it's an issue that Docker has that's been quite bad. Uh, no, because the containers aren't all running simultaneously. So that's the little magician's trick in this talk. The parallel enforces that 30 jobs run simultaneously. And we can chew through the massive numbers because we can actually run 40 jobs simultaneously consistently for two days. Uh, we're not actually running 10,000 simultaneous containers because, yes, that does break in all sorts of exciting ways. So what did the RAM usage end up being uh, for 30 concurrent containers, including the um, temporary files? Um, so what is the RAM usage? That's an excellent question. Uh, let's ask free. H dash S two. Um, seconds argument, two seconds failed. Why? Uh, so the answer is basically not very much. Uh, in Node.js, sorry, in Ruby it's not too bad. In Node.js, if you try and RAM disk things, Node.js has a very inefficient way of unpacking files, and you quite easily blow through 128 gigs of memory if you try and put everything in RAM disks. Um, I think the answer to your question is somewhere between, somewhere around the 30 gigabyte range uh, consistently. One minute remaining, so one last question. <laughs> and then we get two. Um, is there any reason why you didn't um, think about uh, having a local repository as opposed to using Squid to cache it? Uh, yes. Um, I did briefly look into that. There are a couple of reasons I didn't go with that. One is because it would mean allocating more virtual disk for my VM, and I was lazy. And the other one is because it's quite complex compared to not doing that. Wonderful. OK, thank you, everybody. And thank you so much for that talk. And I have something, a little gift for you from the LCA team as a much. token of their appreciation for all of your work. Thank you.